Last, but certainly not least, may I introduce our new accompanist, Miss Sandy Murray. <clears throat> As you already know, she and Zach can make some beautiful music together. And we're just very, very pleased that uh, the Lord has seen fit to bring her to help us make great music together. And she can play that organ, she can play that piano, um, she can direct children's choirs, she can sing, she's a vocalist, and I bet she can dance. Can you dance? <laughs> she loves, there you are, she loves swing dancing, so we've got it all, folks, we've got it all. Again, welcome to you. Thank you for being here. Let's now prepare our hearts to worship the Lord. Good morning. What a beautiful day we have to worship the Lord together today. As we call ourselves into worship, Psalms 95 reads, O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thankfulness, and let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Let us stand this morning as we gather for worship.
Throughout the centuries, Christians have affirmed their faith using the Apostles', Apostles Creed. So let me ask you, Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. together this morning. Lord God, the one who spoke galaxies into existence, the one who gave sight to the blind, uh, Lord, healed the sick, and Lord, the very one who raised the dead. Father, we come to worship this morning. Father, how we desire to know you, to glorify you, Lord, to speak of your name, to sing of your praises, to hear of your word proclaimed. And so, oh Lord Jesus, would you be very present with us this morning. Now, Father, would you prick our hearts, Lord, would you help us to see our sin, but as we run to the Savior, oh, Lord, would you be very present with us as we worship you. And we pray in the mighty name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. This morning, we come to 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 14 for our Old Testament lesson. One of my favorite passages to preach from, uh, 2 Kings 5. In just a short 14 verses, we have five different characters, or six. Uh, we have Naaman, a little girl, kings, Elisha, Elisha's messengers, and Naaman's servants. And as we read about Naaman this morning, uh, Naaman was a supreme commander of the army of Syria, an army's highest commanding officer. Naaman was a great man, a man of high social status and prominence. Naaman was an honorable man in the eyes of his, of his master, those he served. He was highly regarded by the king of Syria because of his many military victories. And Naaman was a mighty man of valor, uh, a term in the Old Testament which speaks of men of great wealth, but also of a courageous warrior. That's who Naaman was. Naaman was a mighty warrior, but he had leprosy, the horrible skin disease, and he suffered from it. But there was a little girl, and this little girl knew that Naaman could be healed by the word of the prophet, by the hand of God. And this little girl who had been captured, uh, who was serving uh, in Naaman's household, told his wife, if only Naaman could travel to, to Israel to, to, to find this man who could heal him. And so he begins that journey uh, to find his own healing of his own leprosy uh, by the hand of God. 2 Kings chapter 5, 1 through 14 this morning. Naaman, commander of the army of the kings of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, would that my Lord were with the prophet who's in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his Lord, thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Israel said, go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, when this letter reaches you, 
Know that I have sent to you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away, saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Or not Abna and Farfa, the, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and he went away in rage. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now may we corporately confess our sins together this morning. Let us pray. Almighty God, Father of mercies, please forgive us our many sins. We acknowledge that we have failed to love you with all of our heart, nor have we loved our neighbors as ourselves. We confess that our thoughts, words, and deeds have often been impure and unclean. Wash us thoroughly from our sin and cleanse us from our iniquity that we may have clean hearts and right spirits according to your abundant mercy through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Father, we are a people who are in desperate need of Jesus, each of us in this room. Lord, we have needs, we have concerns, we have difficulties, we have joys, and yet, Lord, we all need Jesus. Lord, not just for the moment of salvation, daily, Lord, hour by hour, minute by minute, we need Jesus. And so, Father, we come this morning, uh, Lord, to rejoice in your name. And Lord, to honor you, to glorify you this morning. But Father, we also come knowing that we have burdens and we have difficulties and we have those things that weigh heavy on our hearts. And Lord, how we give them to you. For we know, Lord, that you care for us and you meet our needs. And Father, you work in ways at times that we can never expect or imagine, but we trust in you. And by faith, Lord, we walk with you. Father, this morning we particularly pray Lord, for Charlie Smith, for Myra Newport, for Vicki Cummings, for John and Susan Birdwell, for Martha Vanderhaar, Lord, for others who we know that are going through illnesses, and Lord, difficulties, how we pray for your mercy. And for those, Lord, who have doctor's appointments this week, that Father, we pray for good reports. Lord, we also pray for our missionaries. For we know that there are missionaries all around this world who are bold. Uh, Lord, serve you with great courage to speak of your name. We particularly pray, uh, Lord, for the servants for Central Asia, Iran to Russia. Uh, Lord, this small organization, uh, Lord, very similar to mothers of preschoolers uh, that are reaching out to little children. And Lord, reaching families uh, through the little ones. And how we pray, Lord, that this ministry uh, would have great power through your spirit. Uh, that great spiritual fruit would be seen and that you would bless in great ways. 
Uh, Father, we pray for other missionaries too, uh, Lord, who this day, they need encouragement. Uh, Lord, Lord, they need your peace. They need your provision. And how we pray, Lord, that your name would go out, not just in Nashville, not just in America, but all around the world. And Lord, that many would hear the name of Jesus and even today would be saved. Father, we also pray for our country. We know that we're a country in great need of Jesus. Now, Father, how we need to return, uh, Lord, to our biblical values, how we need to return to your word. And, oh, God, we pray for your mercy. Uh, Lord, we pray, Lord, for many voices uh, that would speak of Jesus. Now we pray for those in our government, how we ask well, that many would come to know Christ and would lead uh, by the name of Jesus. Lord, how we need you, we pray again for your presence today as we continue to worship. And as we, as we do, we remember to pray in the way that you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. John Calvin, the reformer, once wrote, let us not seek any other ground of assurance than God's own testimony. And we read in the book of Isaiah 55, God's own testimony in regards to our assurance of forgiveness. We read, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God who will abundantly pardon. The historic Heidelberg Catechism asked this question this morning. How are you righteous before God? And in the response, we're reminded of God's truth that his word cleanses us completely and his forgiveness to us is forever and it's eternal. So let me ask you as we read together, how are you righteous before God? Only by true faith in Jesus Christ, in spite of the fact that my conscience accuses me that I have grievously sinned against all the commandments of God and have not kept any one of them and that I am still ever prone to all that is evil, nevertheless, God, without any merit of my own, out of pure grace, grants me the benefits of the perfect expiation of Christ, imputing to me his righteousness and holiness as if I had never committed a single sin or had ever been sinful, having fulfilled myself all the obedience which Christ has carried out for me, if only I accept such favor with a trusting heart.
Amen. Please be seated. Welcome to all of you. It's great to see you out today. If you are here this morning as a visitor among us, uh, we extend a very warm welcome to you. Thank you for being here. We're glad that you're with us, and uh, may God be glorified by our time together. Please pass the attendance pad, those of you on the inside uh, of your row, inside aisle here, and, um, and sign your name, pass it on down your row, and greet those around you after the service uh, this morning. Please make note of the Ethiopia Act uh, announcement. Uh, two of our missionaries, Andy and Bev Warren, are looking for some uh, short-term assistance, uh, medical mission. So if you're a doctor, a nurse, and you've got a week of your life or 10 days or so that you can uh, spare, there's a website for you to visit, and uh, someone has offered to pay your airfare. So... Uh, nice ministry and a nice gesture. So look that over, and, and if you qualify, then, uh, then give it uh, prayer. Let's now continue to worship the Lord with his tithe and our offerings. Thank you. 
morning. Lord, we're so grateful for all that you give us. Lord, how you allow us to be stewards of, of the many, um, Lord, gifts that you allow us to have. And we thank you, Lord, that we can worship you through your tithe and our offering. I pray, Lord, you would bless it, you'd use it greatly for your church and for your kingdom. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please turn to John 13 this morning, verses 1 through 20. Normally I uh, review my sermon while the choir is singing, but not today. (laughs) Frankly, not the last few weeks. Uh, I can't believe how God's blessed us. Isn't that great? Uh, Zach and Sandy and... um, And Benny, Benny's not part of the music ministry, but he's part of the blessing of God, and so we're very, very grateful to God. I enjoyed Benny's sermon last week. I trust you did as well. Um, I'll tell you that uh, Friday and Saturday, a week ago, Kristen, Rachel, and I were in Chicago and took in two Cubs-Yankees baseball games and had a great time, even saw three-fifths of the Rajakovic family uh, crossing the street in downtown Chicago, uh, oddly enough. But uh, we were here Sunday, and I was really looking forward to being out there where you are and just relaxing and worshiping and enjoying the service, but I learned something. I learned that it's a little bit safer up here than it is out there. I always thought it otherwise. But uh, I took my seat last week and had just barely sat down and a person said, you can't sit on this row. (laughs) I said, why not? They said, well, it's a row for old people. (laughs) So I took that as a compliment and (laughs) got up and moved. Before I could find another seat, I was... um, Accosted, shall we say, <laughs> by another person who said, I didn't invite you to my birthday party. I don't think there was a hello, Jim. <laughs> it was just, I didn't invite you to my birthday party. Now, of course, most of you don't invite me to your birthday parties, but most of you don't tell me that you don't invite me to your birthday parties. <laughs> so. I was trying to process all this, and then the question was, uh, would you like to know why? And as I said, no, the person answered anyway. <laughs> it was all good-natured kidding, I'm happy to report, but I did learn that I learned where I belong. <laughs> <laughs> so here I'm back where I belong on Sunday morning. It wasn't a birthday party, but it, it was uh, a dinner meeting far more sober, somber uh, dinner meeting in, here in John 13. A uh, very memorable one it was. We know it as the Last Supper. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word. We recognize that we uh, come to your word dull of mind and sluggish of heart. And so we pray for your spirit to be our preacher to quicken us to give us ears to hear, to stir our hearts, uh, to make your living word be alive and come alive for us, that we may learn how to love and serve you and each other for Christ's sake. Amen. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, 
What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That is why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? <clears throat> you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I'm telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. <clears throat> All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. <clears throat> the grass withers, the flower fades, <clears throat> stands forever. I'm going to focus on uh, verses 1 through 11, realizing that uh, verses 12 through 20 are basically Jesus' explanation of these first uh, 11 verses. It was a Thursday evening. Jesus' death was imminent, and he knew it. He also knew that he was about to be betrayed. He had known this for some time, uh, probably a year. As far back as the sixth chapter of John, I believe it is, Jesus said to the disciples, one of you is a devil. And so while the disciples may have been surprised at all that was about to transpire, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, knew that this was simply part of the eternal plan of God. So notice his stunning service, verses 3 through 5. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. John records no conversation to this point. Perhaps the disciples were speechless at what they uh, saw. Uh, surely there was some conversation around the dinner table, casual conversation, as is always the case when we uh, have a group of people together. But then, without fanfare and without announcement, Jesus rose and something of a holy hush fell over the entire room as Jesus partially undressed himself, wrapped a towel around him, took a basin and some water, and began very meticulously, intentionally, to wash the feet of each disciple. The disciples themselves were reclining at the table, uh, reclining on uh, thin mats uh, around a low table, Typically, they would lean on an elbow, usually their left elbow. Their feet were extending away from the table. And most significantly, Luke tells us that during that casual conversation, as they were breaking bread together, one of the things they were talking about was which one of them was the greatest. Matthew and Mark also tell us that the disciples had this conversation, but they don't place it at the Last Supper. They place it earlier in the life and ministry of Jesus, leading some of the commentators to speculate that perhaps this discussion took place more than once. In other words, perhaps it was an ongoing discussion, debate, 
dispute among the disciples, which one of us is, is going to be the greatest when Jesus comes in all of his glory? James and John, you remember? James and John made it a point to ask Jesus, can we sit at your right hand and left hand when you come into your kingdom? And Matthew tells us that it was actually their mother that asked the question. <laughs> Maybe they were mama's boys and they put their mother up to asking the question for them, don't know. But what we do know is that apparently the disciples were far too preoccupied with their own status and their own positions of glory. And so it was in that context that Jesus rose and taught them a lesson that they would never forget. The master's not above the servant. Some of you have heard the name Amy Carmichael, a fearless missionary to India in the early 19th century. And Amy Carmichael had learned this lesson well, and she wanted her converts to learn it well, too. She had amazing influence over people. Uh, and so when, when there was a convert to Christianity from high society, the higher caste side of life, uh, she required them, and it's amazing she got away with this, but she required them to dig ditches, or in some cases dig foundations for people from the lower side, the lower caste of society. Because nothing was more degrading in Indian culture. Nothing was more uh, humiliating than for a higher caste person to perform the labor normally performed by a lower caste person. And doubly so when it was done publicly. I suppose we could say that uh, what, what Jesus did here was uh, done at least semi-publicly in front of his disciples and certainly no less stunning than what those Indian converts had to do. More stunning, in fact. His wasn't required, was it? His was strictly voluntary and a dramatic display of the kind of service he came to render for unworthy servants and the kind of service he requires of his people to give to each other. Sometimes we think we're a little too good for that, or we've, uh, we've got a higher calling, to, you know, to save the world <laughs> or save the nation, and we, we just forget the opportunities that are right in our own family or in our own church family. It's a form of self-flattery. It's a form of self-worship. That's what it is. John Calvin uh, realize this. He, John Calvin, uh, Benny mentioned this morning, um, he used to uh, correspond with an Italian priest named Father Calabria. 1647, I believe it was, 1654, thereabouts. And these two men would commiser commiserate about the low estate of uh, spiritual life in Europe until finally Toward the end, uh, uh, Calvin said this, I believe that the men of this age, and among them you and I, think too much about the state of nations and the situation of the world. We are not kings, we are not senators. Lest us, let us beware, lest while we torture ourselves in vain about the fate of Europe, we neglect the poor man who knocks at our door. We neglect our ailing mother. We neglect the young man who seeks our advice. The Lord himself is present, and therefore, let us wash their feet. Stunning service in a, in a context where the disciples were disputing about which one of them might be the greatest. And this stunning service, not surprisingly, was met with reasonable resistance. Uh, verse 8, Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And I call it reasonable because we would probably have responded the same way. This is not according to protocol. This is not the way things were done in those days. Foot washing was reserved for the lowest of the servants. In fact, there are some indications that there were some people within the Jewish community 
who didn't even believe that Jewish slaves should be required to engage in foot washing. Only Gentile slaves should be required to do that. For sure, you can look long and hard throughout the Greco-Roman uh, literature of that day and you will never find a single case of a superior who washed the feet of his inferiors. But here, <laughs> here we have one, don't we? Now what a superior he was, king of kings and lord of lords. And we read here in verse 3 that all th he knew all things had already been given into his hand. And I say to myself, well, Jesus, why don't you just go ahead and zap Judas? Let's get it over with. Uh, why not just go ahead and uh, take the reins and, uh, and assume your role as Messiah? Why didn't he do that? Let me tell you why I think he didn't do it. Two reasons. Number one, that wasn't his glory. You remember two weeks ago, he said, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And his glory was in going low. His glory was not just getting on his knees and washing the feet of his disciples, but going to that old rugged cross. His glory was making atonement for the sins of his people because he knew what they should have known, that the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. Secondly, Jesus had not yet loved his people to the end. You notice verse 1. Before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them how? How long? <laughs> he loved them to the end. He hadn't gone to the end yet. He was getting closer. I, I like what one of the versions says, that he, he was going to show them the full extent of his love. He'd already shown them a lot of love for three years. He'd been a blessing. He'd, uh, he'd fed them. He'd taught them. He'd served them. He'd healed them. He'd raised the dead. He'd turned water to wine, saved the party. But he hadn't shown the full extent of his love. And the disciples had no idea what that looked like. If the disciples were stunned by seeing love on his knees, what do you think went through their heads when they saw love on the cross? This was already too much for Peter. Peter said, you're never going to wash my feet, Lord. That's not the way we do things. That's not my idea of a Messiah. He's a lot like Naaman. Naaman said, I'm not going to wash in that dirty river. I'm not going to do it one time, much less seven times. Okay, Naaman. If you want to stay dirty, diseased, have it your way. <laughs> and Naaman left in a rage, but eventually came to his senses. And so Peter, right here, you never wash my feet, Lord. Okay, Peter, you'll have no share in me. Pride, pride can ruin people. Fortunately for Peter, his pride didn't ruin him. And we, we conclude by looking at this saving supplication. Verse 9, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only. This is a 180. <laughs> not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Just one verse earlier, no way, Jose. And Jesus says, well, okay, if you want to remain unclean, unblessed, unforgiven, unsaved, have it your way. And Peter said, no, well, didn't really mean that. Wash all of me, Lord, head to toe, inside and out. He got the point. Much like King David got the point after his defilement with Bathsheba and all that sordid episode. And David said, wash me, Lord. Wash me thoroughly from my sin. 
and cleanse me from my iniquity. Peter knew he needed something dramatic, significant. He didn't need advice. He didn't need a Band-Aid. He didn't need a little sponge bath. <laughs> he didn't need his wounds slightly healed like the Old Testament prophets were guilty of. He needed a blood bath is what he needed. Because only the blood of Jesus can make the foulest clean, as the hymn writer says. And how clean is that? So clean, people of God, it's as though you and I have never committed one single sin or ever been sinful. It's too good to be true, but it is true. Praise God. Clean whole, healthy, alive. But it would never happen if Jesus stopped at third base. He had to go all the way to that old rugged cross. He had to show the full extent of his love. All the other things Jesus did, those deeds of love and mercy, when he fed the 5,000 and he opened the eyes of the blind, he helped the lame walk, he one miracle after another, one deed of love and mercy, turning water to wine. They were impressive, and they were helpful, but they were incomplete because they didn't save. And Jesus came to save to the uttermost his people by shedding his blood. The psalmist asked a great question. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who can get in there? You know what the answer is? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. And our hands never get clean unless there's a bloodbath, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was the full extent of his love. That's what he came to do. You shall call his name Jesus, right? Way back in the beginning. For he will save his people from their sins. He didn't really come to turn water to wine. That was just a nice sign, a nice benefit. He came to save his people from the sins, to, to take dirty sinners like you and me and make us clean. And thus he had to show the full extent of his love. Many years ago, <clears throat> probably 1990, a wonderful thing happened in, in um, one of my former churches. Uh, a young man was converted in his uh, 40s, I would say. And he came from a very prominent family, had a lot of money, probably too much money. And uh, he'd, he'd been a prodigal for a long time, dabbled in the occult, became something of a leftover hippie, I would say. And um, he was the one member of the family that just couldn't seem to get his act together, but then God did a great work and news spread. This man was a new man in Christ, clean, whole. Problem was his wife. She liked the old husband better than the new husband. And she left. And uh, they weren't divorced yet, but I remember going to see him one afternoon and sitting in his palace, had two young girls, maybe seven and five years old, and the phone rang. And for some reason, he just hit the button and turned, answered with a speaker phone, and it was his wife. And there I was, privy to the conversation between these two people, and the two girls were in the room as well, and as I recall, it was kind of a frivolous conversation for a while, but then the one of the girls wanted to speak. And she said, uh, where are you, Mommy? And Mommy didn't know I was there. Um, but where are you, Mommy? And she said, I'm in my car. Well, where are you going, Mommy? I'm going to Atlanta. Why? Well, I'm going to a rock concert with uh, a bunch of my friends. And the other one spoke and said, we want you to come home, Mommy. 
And mommy said, I'll never forget it, she said, oh, don't worry, sweetie, I will bring you a T-shirt. I'll never forget that crestfallen look on the faces of those children. They didn't want a T-shirt. They wanted their mother. They wanted their mother's affection and nurture and unconditional love. Jesus didn't hand out t-shirts, did he? Jesus showed the full extent of his love. Peter needed to be clean, like you and I need to be clean. And thus, the Lord Jesus showed the deep, deep love of Jesus, not just by going to his knees and washing their feet, but by going to that old rugged cross. So the dirty sinners like Peter, like you and like me, can be as clean as though we've never committed a single sin or ever been sinful. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for the gospel and we thank you that there is a way to be clean and undefiled and pure and holy. So from head to toe, wash us in the blood of your Son in whose name we pray. Amen. So I have a question for you, and I bet you know the answer. It comes from a hymn, and the question is very simple. It's this. If you know the answer, go ahead and say it. Say it together. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. Got that right. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. If you would be clean, head to toe, inside and out, then uh, these symbols here represent the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The good news is that uh, the Lord doesn't ask us to drink the cup he drank. We get to drink a little small cup. He had to drink a really big, painful, difficult cup. This is small, isn't it? This is easy. All that this requires is faith on our part and belief. And if we will believe uh, the righteousness of Christ will be imputed to us. So all you who believe, come and uh, be refreshed and be cleansed once again. If you're here today, you're not a believer, uh, we encourage you to believe, even if all you have is faith like a teeny tiny mustard seed. Don't leave unclean this morning, but give your heart and your life to Christ and know the assurance of, of your sins forgiven and of his everlasting love. The night our Lord was betrayed, he took bread and after giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And afterward, in like manner, he took the cup and he said, drink from this cup, all of you. But this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Paul says, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again.
So often we sing hymns and we don't really notice words. Um, but I want you to notice the, the words to our final hymn, final stanza, in fact. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. Let's stand and sing together. you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and forevermore. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.